Greetings, friends of Dina Rose Ministries. If you are interested in having Dina come and speak at any of your church or organizational events, please contact us at srose at dinarose.com. I am telling you what, before we get into this message, let me just tell y'all, it's just about everything that could go wrong today has gone wrong. Whenever I sat down last night and was going over this message, I was getting so excited and I kind of talked to Kristen a little bit about it during the daytime and I said, I want you guys to learn this new song. I want to do this tomorrow because it's such a powerful song, such an anointed song. We're taking communion and I want to talk about the covenant of the blood. I went to bed with praise on my lips and went to bed a little late because I was tweaking some stuff for the PowerPoint for you guys. And as I got ready to go to bed, I said, Lord, I need you to anoint this sleep because it's a short sleep (laughs) and I need to be ready to go tomorrow. And I am telling you what, I probably was up every 30 minutes throughout the night. And some of you guys know that I'm having to wear this CPAP thing now because they're trying to see if the oxygen may be affecting the heart and all this. And dad gummit if the pressure on the machine didn't shoot sky high. And so that's waking me up, blowing against my face. Then our dog, our wonderful, lovely gunner, decided that he wanted to, to bark at some deer or rabbit or whatever. And so then he's up. Then I get up and Steve's like, I am just feeling like complete garbage. I'm not going to be able to go. So I'm like, okay. So now we're scrambling everything around. We get to the church. The PowerPoint I stayed up late making for y'all wasn't compatible with this computer. And now the mic won't work. (laughs) But I'm here to tell you. The devil don't know what he's doing when he comes against this one because I am a fighter till the end and I know that the one who fights with me gives me victory. So we are going to talk about the blood. I don't care how much he has tried to stop it. I don't care what interference he has tried to throw our way. We are talking about the blood, pleading the blood and exactly what that means. How many of you have ever said that phrase? I know all of us in here have heard it. Why everybody's hands should be in here just saying it. (laughs) Every single hand in this place should have been up. We just sung it. I plead the blood. That is a phrase that is very commonly used by believers. And it's a phrase that I have to tell you, I have heard throughout the years, that's not a biblical thing to say. You're not going to find that in the word anywhere. And a lot of people will come against you whenever you try to pray to plead the blood. But we are going to take a look today at exactly what that means and hopefully inspire you and challenging you. You should be pleading the blood every single day. When we first make that statement, plead the blood, I, for me anyway, I can't necessarily speak for you, but I have a feeling that for most of us in this room, we think that means we are applying the blood. Have you ever really stopped to think about the phrase, who in here has has thought that that means we're applying the blood of Jesus to our life every day? Is that what you've thought it meant when we say, I plead the blood? That's really not what it means at all when we say, I plead the blood. Although we are trying to apply the blood of Jesus over our life, it really goes to a much stronger and deeper connotation than just applying Jesus' blood on our life. The word plead, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, says to argue a case or a cause in a court of law. To argue a case or a cause in a court of law. When you are pleading your case, when you are pleading for the blood over your life, you literally are making a decision in that moment that I am coming before the throne of the judge of all judges, the one who sees every single moment of life. I am coming to him and I am pleading my case. I am pleading and asking for his mercy that the blood of Jesus can be applied to my life and to the life of my family. I am pleading the blood. When you stop and look at it that way, I think it takes it to a little bit more serious level, don't you? I think it shows our desperation of our need and total dependency on the mercy of God. It is not something that we should ever do and take lightly. And I know sometimes we can get in the habit of doing communion once a month or 
whatever you do at home for your devotions and it can become routine and it's just like, eh, you know, familiarity breeds contempt and we really stop reverencing and we really stop paying attention to exactly what we're doing. But I am telling you, when we stop to think about pleading the blood, we can picture ourselves before the courtroom of heaven. Jesus, whose blood we're asking to cover us, is our righteous advocate who stands before the Father, and he is arguing our case for us. On our worst day, on our worst mistake, the, the most horrible thing we could ever do, Jesus is standing right there, Dad. Listen, I lived on earth. I lived in the same body they have. I was tempted just like they are, and it's hard, Dad. It is really hard. I'm just asking you, let my blood cover it. Give them, give them mercy. Give them some grace. And this is the court scene that is going on in heaven when we plead the blood. What exactly is the point of the blood? Why do we even need to plead the blood? In Genesis chapter 3 and also chapter 4, we see the very first sacrifice ever made. When man sinned, Adam and Eve, when they failed big time and they were disobedient to God, the Lord comes and he's walking in the garden in the cool of the day as he always did and he calls out to them and they're afraid because they're naked. And God said to them, to them who told you that you're naked? Like, okay, something's happened here that you are now having a realization of something in my presence that you've never had a realization of before. Do you know in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, anytime it talks about nakedness, is it is a reference to sin? When the Bible says, I will uncover your nakedness, I will show your nakedness before the people, God is talking about our sin. So when they looked at each other and said, whoa, we are naked. It was the first revelation that we have where mankind became aware of their sin. And God had to cover that sin. And he did it through the slaughter of an animal to make them clothes of skin. The blood became very important when it came to covering over the sin of the people. I want you to go with me to Leviticus chapter 17. And let's take a look at this verse of scripture, Leviticus 17, verse number 11. If you have your Bibles, and if you don't, he'll have it popped up there for you. Leviticus 17, 11, this is what the Lord said, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. There is absolutely no other way to be cleansed of sin than through blood. There is no other way to come up under the protective hand of God than through blood. All right? I want us to go over and let's look at Genesis chapter 17. And I want you to take a look with me at the very first covenant that God had made with mankind. Because we are now under a new covenant. A lot of people want to say, oh, the old covenant's over and done with. And we're going to read a passage of scripture today that would kind of let us think that, but not necessarily in the, in the way in which Christians apply it today. We'll, we'll explain the difference in a minute. But Genesis chapter 17, let's look at the power of the blood and what, what we're going to get down to today as far as the importance of applying the blood over our life and pleading our case before the Father. Starting right there at verse number 1. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you. All right, we're fixing to get our look, our first look at the first covenant between God and man. I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. He added the, because we're going to learn in a few minutes that that is the letter in the Hebrew alphabet that means the breath of God. You are now Abraham because I am breathing my life into you and making a covenant with you. For I have made you a father of many nations. 
I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. That every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. The first covenant between God and man, whenever he was outlying his promise to Abraham, that he was going to raise up from him a grand nation. Many, many, many people, many kings, many prophets, many priests would all come from Abraham. But it was coming through a covenant of blood. How's that, you say? I think everybody in this room full well knows what circumcision is. Abraham was 99 years old whenever he was first circumcised before the Lord. And circumcision of any male brings blood. The significance of that, why would God choose that? Out of everything that God could have chosen, why would he have chosen circumcision to be a seal of the covenant? Because that meant that every single person born through Abraham, the seed had to come through the sign of the covenant to come through the blood. Think about it. Whenever Abraham knew Sarah, his wife, and she conceived Isaac, the son of promise, he came through the blood. He was birthed through the covenant of the blood. It was an everlasting statute, and he said, I want you to carry it through all time. Now, of course, we see in the New Testament where he talks about the circumcision of the heart. It becomes a new thing because we become alive to Christ and it's a a rending of our heart. It is the tearing of our heart that becomes more important in latter time. But with Abraham, it was established through blood. Covenant always comes through blood. And I want you to hold on to that because we're going to be moving into the new covenant here in just a little bit. But when we talk about pleading the blood or applying the blood as safety and protection, really and truly, do we know where we even get that? Some may, but some may not understand it quite in its fullness. So hop over with me to Exodus chapter 11. We're going to read a little bit in chapter 11. We're going to read a little bit in chapter 12, and we're going to try to put all this together to show you where that phrase even comes from. You know, sometimes we we say phrases. I went to Maggie not too long ago. I don't even remember what the phrase is. And I said, where did that phrase such and such come from? You remember you went home and you went and looking it up for me on the internet. I can't even remember what the phrase was now. But sometimes we have phrases and sayings that we do all the time and we don't even know where it came from. It's just my mama said it and her mama said it and her mama's mama said it and we just say it and don't even know what it means. Some people have gotten a a good uh, Christian ease from being in church for a while. You hear your pastor say something or you hear other believers say something. Maybe you turn on some Christian TV and you hear an evangelist say something. You're like, oh, that sounds really good. I'll just start saying that. But then we don't even stop to really understand, wait a minute, what am I really saying when I say that? And I think the phrase pleading the blood is one of those. We've just gotten such a habit of saying it that I don't really know that we know the origins well or understand the magnitude and the power that comes with that phrase. So in Exodus chapter 11, we're going to start there at verse number one. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh. He had already done the nine, but there was one more to go. I'm going to bring it on Pharaoh and on Egypt. And afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. 
Moreover, the man, Moses, was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog even move its tongue against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does indeed make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Now jump down to chapter 12, starting at verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both male and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now jump down to verse 21, same chapter. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. God is establishing a pattern here that if you want to be saved from what I'm about to do to the people around you, you have got to come under the blood. Now, in this case, it was the blood of a lamb. But put up for me the first picture. Hopefully, you guys can see that clear enough. This is exactly what it looked like whenever the Egyptians had to grab the bunch of hyssop. They dipped it down into the blood of the lamb. You can go read the whole story about how they had to sacrifice the lamb and all the specifics. God is a God of order, (laughs) and he's a God of specifics. And we need to read it to find out exactly how he wants things done. But... This is what they would do. They would put it on top of the doorpost and on both sides. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself why? Just leave that up there for a minute, bud. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself why? Like, why couldn't they just put it on the top of the door? Why couldn't they maybe just put it on the side? Or why couldn't they just paint a big circle like right on the door? Why did it have to be done in such a specific way? God never commands us anything that he doesn't have a reason behind it. And it would really do us all a lot of good to start studying the Bible more and really digging in. When we see a pattern of what God is doing, like, why did you do it that way? Like, I'm one of those people. Matter of fact, my kids will joke with me because there's been a lot of things through the years, like the cornucopia and the cupid and mistletoe and a lot of the little traditions that we've had all throughout the years that I would stop and say, well, I wonder where that came from. Let's look up. And they're like, Mom, you're banned. Don't ever look up anything again because you're taking away all the fun. (laughs) But when we really look at the origins and we really dig in and we really see, okay, why did God have us do it a specific way? There had to be a reason. Well, I'm going to show you this morning. And whenever I learned this, it was like an eye-opening radical thing to see how God would even work in something like this, putting some blood on a door. And it taught me. That whenever God gives you directions, follow it to the T. Don't leave anything out. Don't take shortcuts. Don't try to do it a different way, thinking, well, this is close enough. It'll be all right. No, because there's a reason why he tells you. I want you to go ahead and put up the next slide, bub. You're going to see a letter come up on your screen that is a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Now, the spelling can be different depending on which Hebrew lexicon you pull up, all right? So don't get stuck on that if you're used to just spelling it C-H-E-T. They pronounce that chet. The Hebrews write in symbols, 
not necessarily words like we do, and they don't have a, a symbol for every single letter. They combine them, and it's just, it's a real interesting study if you ever want to look on how to read or write in Hebrew. This is the letter Chet in the Hebrew language. What does it kind of look like to you? The blood on the door frame. When the children of Israel would take a look at the blood and whenever they were painting this on the doorpost, the first thought in their mind was the letter Chet because to them it symbolized a fence or a wall. It also symbolized separation. Immediately, what the Israeli mind would go to, God really is bringing a separation, a distinction between us and the children of Egypt. There is a wall that I am fixing to build up for my protection and the protection of my family. I am erecting a fence around my family because God is separating me and marking me as something different. Pretty cool, huh? Let's look at the next slide. There is another letter that is also in the Hebrew alphabet. Still kind of looks like it, slightly different, but close enough. We have the word, <sighs> we just talked about it. He changed his name to Abraham. Because when they saw this symbol, it always signified the breath of God, life. So already we're looking at this door, and as they're painting it on, they're thinking to themselves, God is fencing us in. He's creating a distinction. He is separating us from the children of Egypt. We are a different, distinct people, and his breath is on us in this moment. They didn't know what they were about to expect, how the death was going to happen. They didn't really know. They just knew that God was sending the death angel out at midnight, and it was going to begin slaughtering the firstborn of not only human life, but also the animal life. Every firstborn throughout the land was about to be slaughtered, and that's kind of a scary thought if you really stop and think about it. If you were told tomorrow that we had a, had a missile that would be flying towards the coast of Florida and that it was going to be a nuclear missile and that you could only get to protection in one way, that you had to get under the ground into an underground bunker to protect you from that, your mind automatically would go to fear. You wouldn't know what to expect, how it was going to look, what was going to happen. But if you could see reassurance in what God was having you do, don't you think that put your mind at ease? But he didn't stop with just two. Pull up the next slide for us, bub. This is the letter Tav. Again, slightly different, but still has that same genuine look. And when the Israelites would see this symbol, they would think of covenant. That's the reason why I just read you the covenant with Abraham. All throughout their stay in Egypt, from time to time, they would remind each other, listen, we know we're in a land of bondage. We know that we have been brought here because of our disobedience. Life is hard. We are slaves to Pharaoh. This isn't optimal for us. But one day, one day, our deliverance is coming because Jehovah has made a covenant with Abraham. Jehovah has made a covenant with Isaac and with Jacob. One day our deliverance will come because we have covenant and God never breaks a covenant. So as all the rumbling is going throughout the camp that day and as they are preparing their doorposts to apply the blood, they are taking a look at it and they're seeing, okay, we are being fenced in. We are being made a separate, distinct people from the nation of Egypt. God sees us. He's got us. He's breathed his breath of life on us. Life will be sustained here. And he will remember his covenant that he will not completely annihilate us along with the Egyptian people. That's pretty amazing. God never asks us to do anything that there's not a particular reason. There is a method to what he's asking us to do. Even in the way he had them to apply the blood over their doorpost. And when the angel was sent through the land that night, 
If he saw that, he would skip right over your house. Now, here's the thing. The children of Israel had a choice. Moses comes to them and says, I've had a conversation with God, and God's going to do it. You can believe it or not. If you were here Wednesday night, we talked about those grumbling, complaining Israelites who still had a hard time believing God no matter what they saw. He had just done nine amazing miracles through the plagues. But Moses is still like, you can believe it, you cannot. Do what you want to do. But I'm just here to tell you, God has said he's coming through tonight. He's sending the angel, and it will slaughter every firstborn. And if you don't want your firstborn to be part of that massacre, then you better go slaughter the lamb and apply the blood because it is the only thing that is going to save you and seal the covenant. So as they were doing it and as they were roaming around throughout the day and they saw all their neighbors doing it, everywhere they looked, they saw the sign of the covenant. That is amazing. When the angel came through at midnight, what is he seeing? He's not seeing blood. He's seeing the tav, which was the sign of covenant that God is here. And this is a people that is separated off. I can't touch them. They are to live. Now, the interesting thing about the letter tav is that for a large part of their history, the Hebrews would write a tav as a mark of the cross. So when that angel came in and saw the tav that was over the door, he's remembering and looking forward to the new covenant of the cross. Isn't God incredible? Every single thing he does is absolutely amazing, and he leaves no detail out, none. He was already looking forward to whenever Jesus was going to shed his blood for a new covenant that was going to offer protection to people in the future by what he had them symbolize on their doors all those years before. When we say we plead the blood, this is exactly where that phrase comes from. It comes from the moment that the death angel went through and passed throughout the land. And only those who were in the land of Goshen and only those who had the seal upon the door, the sign of the covenant, would be spared. Now I want you to look with me at Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15, verse number 26. It is awfully quiet in here today. It is, whenever I, I was sitting at my desk going through these scriptures, just weeping before the Lord, like, Lord, you are so good to show us this stuff. It, it was so astounding and so amazing when you see it all come and be put together. All right, let me see here. Exodus chapter 15, and I believe we're looking for verse 26. It says that there God made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. And he said to them, if you diligently heed my voice, the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought upon the Egyptian, for I am the Lord who heals you. God was reconfirming his covenant to the children of Israel, saying, listen, I have a covenant with Abraham that you would be a great and mighty nation. I'm going to pass over your house so that your firstborn does not have to be part of that slaughter because you are my covenant people. I have sworn to your forefathers that I would do this thing. It doesn't have anything to do with you at this moment. I am looking at you because I'm remembering my covenant with your fathers. But if you want to stay in covenant with me, you must align your lives with my word. That is pretty incredible. Now flip over with me to Hebrews chapter 8. To Hebrews chapter 8, and we're going to get down to the nitty gritty of what we're about to do with communion here. I just wanted to lay the foundation for you of what the importance of the blood was. You didn't have any type of covering at all over your life without a covenant of blood. We saw it in Genesis 3 and 4. 
We saw it again with Abraham. We read in Leviticus that it is the blood that covered. It was the blood that made the atonement. And now we're going to take a look at Hebrews chapter 8, starting at verse number 12. Nope, starting at verse number 7. Hebrews 8, starting at verse number 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. All right, now here's where people kind of get that the old covenant no longer stands. Every promise in the old covenant still stands. But what we're about to see is that it fell a little short because the blood of animals could only cover our sin. It could be used in a redemptive sense to cover, but it could never remove our sin. There had to be a new sacrifice and a new source of a pure blood that would absolutely remove our sin instead of just covering our sin. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, God says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they didn't continue in my covenant. So I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their heart, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none of his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they all will know me. In other words, you don't have to tell your neighbor or your society who God is, because God has written something on the heart of every man that innately they know, and they know when he is missing from their life. They just need our help sometimes to get there and to find him. You shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. That's your new covenant right there. I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that I would be their God and make of them a great and mighty nation. Their children are born, they're coming through the wilderness, but they forgot me, so I disregarded them. I sent them into exile, and I sent them into banishment for a period of time to teach them their dependence upon me. But I am coming to a point in time when I'm going to reestablish my covenant. It's not that it's a new covenant as though it had never existed before. It is a reestablishment of all the promises that God had already given us from the very beginning. But this time it was going to be sealed in a new way because the blood of animals was not sufficient. There had to be another way to seal this, this covenant and this promise. It was a renewal of the covenant. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, In him, meaning Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The only way that we have forgiveness of sin and that we are redeemed from a life of bondage to sin is through the precious blood of Jesus. Because it is now his blood that seals the renewal of this covenant with God. It is a new covenant covered by a new type of blood where there was no impurity in it at all. It was 100% perfect. We learned last week that when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and she became pregnant with the Son of God, it was through a miraculous divine encounter that the blood that Jesus carried was blood from the Father, uncorruptible by sin. It is a brand new way that God was sealing this deal. Hebrews chapter 9, starting at verse number 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. 
He entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. If you want to receive the promises of the old, you have to apply the blood for the new. There is only one way to get it. You can go out and you can slaughter a lamb tomorrow. If we were looking at a Hebrew calendar and if we were celebrating the Jewish feast of Passover, we could go out and we could get us a lamb. We could follow what we see in the Bible as far as how to cut it, how to cook it, what we were to do with the bread and all the things. And we could absolutely enjoy and partake in a Passover feast. We could be believing with all of our heart. We could put that blood out as a sign of the covenant, but it would do us no good. Because the death that is coming now is a spiritual death that only sees the covenant of the new blood. It doesn't see the covenant of the old. Animals are not good enough to get us into heaven. It can only be by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12 said, And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. It is all about the blood of Jesus. Every single bit of it. Now I'm fixing to read to you the communion passages. And um, Bub, if you can go ahead and slip to the keyboard up here. They don't necessarily have to have the scriptures back there for this. Hopefully you have your Bibles. If not, your phones should have a Bible app. If not, just listen. <laughs> we're going to read the communion scriptures here in just a moment. And we're going to take communion together, applying the blood of Jesus. But before we do, I want to read to you an amazing promise that God has given us that when we stay covered up under his blood, we're going to be partakers of. The only way that you're going to be able to be a partaker of what I'm about to read you, and I'm going to read it to you from the New Living Translation, so if you don't have that translation, you're just going to have to listen. You can look it up when you get home. The only way that you are going to have access to this promise that I'm about to read you is to stay covered under the blood to plead the blood over yourselves and over your family every day. You have to stay under the blood. God's admonition to the children of Israel was, I'm gonna establish this covenant. And if, if you keep the law that I have given you, if you stay in right fellowship with me, then you're gonna be covered under this covenant. It is the same even now. We have gotten to a place in the church <clears throat> to where lawlessness abounds and the Bible warned us that those days would come. <clears throat> we have gotten to a place in our culture and inside the church that we think that we can live sloppy Christianity, not crucifying our flesh, but living according to the dictates of whatever feels good today, that's what I'm gonna do. Do you know that is a satanic philosophy? Some of you may know the name Aleister Crowley. Some of you may not know that name. But he is one of the most recognized names in the occult. He was a Satanist who lived over in England. And it was Anton LaVey who studied under Aleister Crowley that brought the Church of Satan to America in the 60s. Aleister Crowley wrote a book that's their Bible that they live by. And the central theme that they live by in that book is do what thou wilt, for that is the whole of the law. You will see t-shirts, you will see sweatshirts. Some of your favorite musicians are spotted all over online wearing 
that statement on their shirt. It is a demonic philosophy that has even infiltrated the church. And we, we say it all the time by this. Well, that's between them and God. There's no accountability. We can't get involved in each other's life. That's, that's between you and God, brother. Pray about it. Whatever you think God's telling you to do. That is a morphing of this satanic philosophy. Whatever feels good to you, whatever seems right to you. Do you know what your Bible says? There is a way that seems right to man. But in the end, it leads to death and destruction. That is why we need the accountability and we need each other to hold us accountable. And we can't live every day just doing whatever we want to. There's a lot of things I would like to do that I know I can't do. We are to get up every single day and crucify our flesh. And unfortunately in the church right now, do you know how many believers were in that rally supporting the Harris ticket? Knowing good and well what they stand for whenever it comes to killing unborn babies, to allowing adolescent children to allow their sexual parts of their body to absolutely be mutilated to think that it's okay to take a 13 or 14 year old girl who happens to get pregnant and take her down to an abortion clinic and murder that baby without even telling her parents vote no on four by the way knowing what they stand for but because they don't like the personality of somebody else who may be a little gruff on the outside, I'll go sit in there and I'll, I'll vote for that. You can't do that and please God. I'm gonna shoot straight with you today. You cannot do that and please God, you can't. You can love me, you can hate me, <laughs> you, can, you can leave out of here and think I'm never gonna talk to her again. Well, then you ain't under the covenant because forgiveness and love and grace and mercy, all that applies. But we live in a time and in a season where Christians don't necessarily want to be held accountable. And I am here to tell you this morning, I want, I'm going to read to you Psalm 91 here in a minute. And we've heard that a lot lately with the hurricanes that have come and the mudslides that we have seen, earthquakes that have been happening this week alone, just all the things that's going on around us. And we all want to quote Psalm 91. We all want to say, oh, but we're under the covenant. But my question to you today really is, are we? There is a beautiful, beautiful covenant that God has made with us to give us everything our hearts could ever desire. The Bible says that he will give us the desires of our heart when we walk according to his ways. You know how he can, how he can do that? Because then our desires become his desires. We don't desire wrong things when we're truly connected to the Father. And I know a lot of us in this room have walked with God for a real long time. But there may be some that are online that you're new to this thing. And I am telling you, there has to be a marked difference. When we come into a relationship with Jesus and we come up underneath the covenant of his blood, his blood is precious blood. His blood may be free to you, but it cost him everything. And in reality, it's really not free to you because it's going to cost you your life too. And the sad thing is we have way too many pastors in way too many churches who will tell you that it's okay to keep doing the things you're doing and keep living like you're living. And, you know, we don't want to offend the people and, and we don't want to make them feel bad if they're struggling still in this area. Listen, truth is truth. And it is truth that sets us free. And until we get back to preaching the real thing, and until we challenge God's people, he said, if, if you will stay in relationship with me, if you will continue to be obedient to me. It's not about a law. I don't get up every day thinking about a million things that I should be doing or shouldn't be doing. I get up every day and I go to my father. And I say, God, I love you so much. Thank you that you gave me breath today. What do you want me to do with my day today? Are there divine appointments that you want to bring my way? 
when I get a little frazzled and a little flustered like this morning and everything is going wrong and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going in there to preach on the blood and everything is going wrong. I have to stop and say, bud, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to snap at you like that. It's not your fault. The computer won't work. I didn't have to get up this morning telling myself, now remember, if you do something ugly, you got to apologize. Remember, we put rules on ourselves and we make these laws on ourselves that make it so challenging and so difficult. But what I'm here to tell you, if you will stay in right relationship with the Father and stay connected to Him, He'll just tell you. And you will know. And if you obey that little voice that you hear that's just whispering softly to you, you should apologize. And you will humble yourself enough to stay in obedience to the word then every single promise that's in these pages is yours. Some of you are not walking in your promises because there's levels of disobedience that you know's there. You know that there are some things in your life that need to be carved off. But you haven't quite gotten to the place to where you're ready to crucify your flesh. And then you wonder, but why aren't my prayers working, God? You said I could have this, and you said I could have that, and you said I could have this, and God is sending you a reminder this morning that I'm not a celestial Santa Claus, that you make a list and you send down, and if you think you were good enough throughout the year and that you deserve it, then I'll give it to you. It's all about being connected to me, in relationship with me, staying in covenant with my son and applying the blood of his sacrifice over the doorpost of your life. Because when I pass by you and when I see the blood, when I see that you're connected to him, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. You're going to be living in a way that's, that just shows the world you're connected to me. And when he sees the blood, he passes right over without bringing the harm and the destruction. He promised us that. I will put on you none of the diseases. None of those struggles. You're not going to face the death of your firstborn son. If you will stay in covenant with me, if I can see the blood applied to your life. Psalm 91 from the New Living Translation. Here is a promise that you can be guaranteed to be yours if you stay under this covenant. It says, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly diseases. You ain't got to worry about this new strain they're trying to put on the people. You don't have to get in fear. Stay in covenant. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor of the arrows that fly in the day. We may be facing World War III on our soil here soon. It sure looks like it's gearing up that way. He is saying when you see those things begin to happen, you don't have to get in fear. Don't be afraid of the terrors that happen at midnight. Don't be afraid when you see those arrows and guns and cannons and missiles flying in the daytime. Do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, and though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If, the biggest word in the Bible, if you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you everywhere you go. They will hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust my name. When they call on me, I will answer. 
I will be with them in their trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. There is not a promise better than that. There is not another religion on this earth that can give a better promise than that. Not one. We have the greatest promise from God our Father. And it is all sealed in the new covenant of the blood of Jesus. This is never anything that we should take lightly. A matter of fact, you can read 1 Corinthians 11. Just about the whole chapter, Paul was getting on to them for how they came into the place to take the communion of the Lord in a wrong way. They were just making it of nothing. It is a reminder to us of the precious, precious, precious blood of Jesus that he shed not only so we could get to heaven, like that's just the beginning. He did that for us, that while we are still here on this planet, we can have a victorious life. Yes, warfare is going to come. Yes, we're still going to have an enemy that we have to fight. Yes, there's still going to be difficult days. Yes, we still may struggle with the enemy trying to come at us with a disease. But this is when we come back to the book. And this is when whenever we call him to his word and we say, God, no, I am covered up underneath the blood of your son. And you promised that none of these diseases would come on me. You promised me that I would live in victory. You promised me that I would not have to fear the terror in the nighttime. You promised me, God. But before we can do that with boldness and confidence, we have to check ourselves and say, Lord, are there areas of disobedience where I've not done something you've asked me to do? Do I still harbor bitterness, unforgiveness, strife, jealousies? I can tell you from personal experience, you can think that you've worked everything out. I, I have been round and round all these corners with God this year. I've called God to his word for healing, for miracles, for long life. There's a passage of scripture that says he gives us 120 years. I'm like, I want every blasted one of them and I want them to be healthy and happy. He promises us so many things, but I've had to stop and I've had to say, okay, wait, Lord, is there something that I've forgotten about? Is, is there some bitterness in my heart that maybe I didn't remember? Is there an act of obedience that you've asked me to do that I haven't done? And what, is there any hindrance at all? And I'm going to tell you things that go back years that I have forgotten about. The Holy Spirit would bring it to my mind. And he'd say, you really haven't let this go. He'll work with you when you ask. And he does it so gently, so lovingly, so patiently, and so kind. Because he wants you to have these promises more than you want them. He created you for promise. He doesn't want to see you struggle. He wants you to have everything that the Bible says that we could have. And he promises that we'll have it. So if the, if the men and the ladies will come, whoever's going to administer communion today. And while they are quietly administering that, I want y'all to still pay attention to me the best that you can. They'll come around and make sure everyone has some. starting at verse number 14. The reason why we do this, and maybe some of you are watching online, I'm not sure how much of you can see what's going on in here, but we are about to pass out the elements. You have a little cup of juice that represents the blood of Jesus. And I know that when we switched from the red grape juice to the white grape juice, People got a little discombobbled because they're like, wait a minute, that don't look like blood anymore. But it does if you look at the true plasma of blood. Do you know it's the very color that's in your cup? That is where the life of the blood is. 
So you've got a cup that represents the blood. And you've also got a cup that represents, or you've got the piece of bread that also represents Jesus. Now I want you to listen to this real quick as we tie these together while they're passing that out. In Exodus chapter 12, it says, So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. This is talking about the day of Passover. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. Leaven always represents sin in the Bible. He said, get it out. Get it out of your house. On the first day you're going to remove the leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So we're going to take a moment to examine ourselves in just a second. On the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. And on the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation for you. Thank you, Mr. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this same day, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven shall be found in your home, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he's a stranger or a native. You shall eat nothing leavened, in all of your dwellings, you shall eat unleavened bread. Then if we look down to verse number 34, he says, so the people hurried. Now this, the, the, past, the uh, massacre had just happened. And it said, so the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their needle bowls, kneading bowls still bound up in their clothes and on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians the article of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they granted them whatever they requested. Therefore they went out plundering the Egyptians. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were driven out of Egypt quickly and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. Now, Dina, why are you going back to that? Because let's look at the words of Jesus. In Luke chapter 22, starting at verse number 14, he's bringing it all back to that first night of Passover, where they knew full well about the bread and the blood. The bread of sustenance that was to have no sin associated with it, no leaven, and the blood, which was their redemption. Jesus said, when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And then he said this to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He was celebrating the Passover because he was going to be that sacrificial lamb. They were about to plead a new kind of blood over the lentils of their home and on the doorpost of their home. That's why he had to die on Passover. Do we see how it all connects? You can't leave off the Old Testament. For those of you who want to only live Matthew to Revelation, you're missing the biggest part of the story. Everything Jesus did, he came to fulfill what had already been laid out for us in the Old Testament. The perfect will of the Father. He had to die at Passover because he was that Passover lamb. That when his blood is applied to the doorpost and the lintel of our lives, that the death angel will pass over. And there will be no more spiritual death in our life because we've applied the precious blood. But it goes deeper than that. With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 
Then he took the cup and gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. So do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. It's all about the bread and the blood. The bread and the blood. Do you see now why they had to talk about that bread? It was a reminder that the life-staining sustenance cannot have anything of the flesh or any sin in it because you are fleeing quickly. I am going to rescue you quickly. You don't even have time for this stuff to develop in your life because all you need is me. I am the bread born in Bethlehem, the basket of bread. I'm the bread of life. When you take this, when you do this, I want you to remember the blood and the bread that we saw all the way back in Egypt whenever I brought such great deliverance for you. And that was the beginning of your procession into your promise. So stand on your feet because as we get ready to take this this morning, we're going to pray for every need that is represented in this place. Steve's not here because he's homesick today. It came on him suddenly. I believe it's some spiritual warfare. We need to pray. Let's continue to pray for mom and dad. We need to pray for Tina. She's been having some more frequent episodes that they can't quite figure out. So we need to pray. We're going to plead the blood. I'm not going to go through all of these one by one because that's we're all in here to do this together. We're going to plead the blood over every one of these situations. Because it is in the covenant of the blood where all these answers come. It's in the covenant of the blood where we have a right to access the throne and say, Jehovah Rapha, my healer, Tina's healer, Steve's healer, Jehovah Jireh, our provider, Jehovah Sidkenu, our righteousness, Jehovah Shalom, our peace in the midst of turmoil. It is in the covenant of the blood. And as we get ready to take this, I want you to envision yourself literally on your road. You are marching to the fulfillment of the promise. That's what the Passover means. They were leaving the bondage of Egypt, heading into the promised land. And on their way out, God gave them a beautiful sign of what was to come. That one day there would be a new blood that they could put over the doorpost of their life. That would point people to their promised victory in the end. So take your bread. God, we lift this bread to you this morning, God, as a beautiful reminder, Lord, not only what you did way back at the very first Passover, but God, all through the generations. Jesus, we thank you that you were willing to sacrifice your body and that your body was torn, your flesh was ripped apart, it was broken and it was bruised so that we may eat of the bread of life. There's not enough words in the human language, Father, that could adequately ever express how truly grateful we are. And God, I pray today that as we take of this bread, that we will remember the sacrifice that Jesus made, that we will remember the covenant that you established so many years ago, that you are taking us out of our bondage into our promise and in our promise is where we may reside when we stay in relationship with you thank you lord you guys may take the bread and i plead the blood i plead the blood to plead the blood 
And as we take it this time, I want you to think of yourself standing before a courtroom. Some of you have some things that's going on in your family, some that I'm aware of. Some of you have issues I'm not aware of. Some of you have issues happening inside your physical bodies. It, it could be a number of things that you are facing right now. And I want you to picture yourself stepping into the courtroom of heaven, every eye closed in this place. And let your mind go there with me for just a minute. Because we learned earlier today that pleading is about bringing a case or a cause before a judge. I want you to picture yourself right now at this moment stepping into that courtroom of heaven before your righteous judge who judges righteously. And I want you to picture yourself laying before him your case this morning. Give him the facts of what your circumstance is. State it before him. God, this is what is going on. Here are the facts of what I am facing. And in your own words, this is now what I want you to tell him. But God, I am coming to you as my righteous judge because I am pleading I am pleading before you. I am pleading my cause. I am pleading my case. I am laying before you the facts of the circumstances that I find myself in. But God, in doing so, I am covered with the blood of your son that gives me every right to every promise that you have already laid out in your word. And God, I am pleading with you this morning. I am arguing my case. I am stating emphatically with boldness and faith that the blessing of heaven is mine. And I am reaching up to take it because of the shed blood of your son. I'm going to give you just a minute to say it to God in your own way. I want you to envision yourself. The Bible says we come boldly before the throne of grace because we know our rights as his children. Now, Lord, this morning, corporately as a family, we are going to apply the blood of Jesus to our lives once again. Your word says that as often as we do this, it is a reminder of that precious covenant. God, and not only is it a reminder to us, but it is also a reminder to you. God, that we are your people called by your name, walking according to your principles. And God, we stand covered under the blood. It is no longer us that you see, but Lord, when you look at us, you simply just see the blood of Jesus. And the blood demands the blessing. So God, I pray for every person in this room that as we put this cup to our lips and as we drink this cup by faith today, as we reapply the blood over our lives, God, we are pleading our cases before you and we are expecting a righteous judgment. We are expecting a final outcome that is for our good because you've promised it to us. We receive it in faith. We thank you for the sacrifice, Jesus. Take the drink. One time, but I really feel strongly in my spirit that I am supposed to say this. I really feel like the Lord has said there are some days coming. Dad's been kind of warning this. There's some prophetic voices that's been warning this, but I have not been able to get away from it for two days trying to prepare for today and what we were going to be talking about on Sunday morning. And I just can't get away from it. That there are some things coming. They're coming. They cannot be stopped. They have been put in motion. And they're coming. And it's going to look scary. And it's going to look dark. But this is what God says this morning. You are my people. You are my people. And I see around you that line of blood that has been drawn. I am putting up a fence. And I am putting up a distinction. I am separating you of the people of the nation because you are my people just stay under my blood stay under my blood and as these things begin to develop when I see the blood applied you and your household shall be spared I believe that is a word from God I believe it is a prophetic utterance I can't tell you when it's coming 
I can't tell you what it's going to be, but I can tell you there are some things that's coming. And God has needed for his people to understand the power of the blood, to stay under the blood, that his blood will give you refuge. Let's sing it one more time. God, I just pray for your people. Raise your hand for the blessing. God, they have made the step forward today in faith. They are believing what they've heard this morning, the truth of your word, that your blood covers it all. And God, I just pray that as they leave this place today, that they will be encouraged with a new pep in their step. God, that no matter what circumstances are flying around them or what we may see in the next days coming ahead, that God, they are going to stay sheltered under the blood and they will believe you for your divine promise that they are on their way of it. God, bring them all back here safely on Wednesday night. Be with them, I pray, in Jesus' mighty name.